translation of cosmology cannot be complete because they have an initial singularity. So this is where I'm coming from. Now, I can't resist, though, giving an advertiser to this talk, something I've been preoccupied uh, over for the last 10 days. So, and this is challenges which the recently discovered high redshift of massive black holes pose. I actually think that these observations will tell us the demise of the vanilla lambda CDN model. So I'll start with an appetizer and then the main course. Mm -hmm. The main course will be challenges for bouncing these models. So the main message for the main course is going to be that there are severe challenges to the kind of bouncing cosmologies that we cosmologists have been working with. And we need new input from gravity, from quantum gravity, to come up with improved models. So, so that's going to be the main point. OK. So there was this recent Nature article about uh, 10 days, two weeks ago, the discovery of a 12 billion solar mass, supermassive black hole at a redshift of 6.3. That's quite a high rate. With this in comparison, the main epoch of star formation is at redshift smaller than 8. And this is a supermassive black hole of this huge mass at a redshift of 6.2. Now, actually, there are already more than 40 supermassive black holes at a mass greater than 10 to the 9 solar mass at redshift greater than 6. So this is like the tip of an iceberg, but there's a big iceberg there. Now, supermassive black holes are assumed to form due to accretion of gas, or maybe cold dark matter, onto compact seeds. And the most promising mechanism for compact seeds are so-called population free stars. So, but the challenge now is, where do these compact seeds come from if we need to have them at redshift greater than 6.2? So I'm going to show that this is impossible to obtain using the vanilla and the CDM model. But I'll propose a very simple modification, an extra input to the lambda CDM model with which we can easily come up with an explanation. Okay, so if you look at review articles on supermassive black holes, and I must confess that until a couple of months ago I didn't know anything about supermassive black holes. So if you look at the review articles, you'll find one equation, and it is this equation, which tells you how a seed with initial mass m sub i develops into a black hole of mass m sub f. If you let it accrete for time interval delta t, and there are some efficiency factors that end to the equation. And I've taken the usual values of the efficiency factors. So I've taken the upper limit on this efficiency factor. Is it the phenomenological formula or is some? No, no, there's some astrophysics behind okay. it, but there's a substantial amount of phenomenology. Mm -hmm. OK, so now you need to postulate some seeds. And again, if you look at the review article, I'm not a volunteer, um, then there are these three classes of seeds which are being proposed. So population three stars. So these are stars before there were any metals. They're old stars. And since there are no metals, these stars can be larger than the stars from that day. <coughs> then cold, dense gas clouds, or remnants of compact galaxy collisions. So basically, these are not any objects which have to be present before the supermassive black holes, because they have to grow into the supermassive black holes over time interval consistent with this formula. So now, if you take this formula and you use various masses of supermassive black holes at a redshift of 6. Then, and if you want to have your seeds be the population 3 stars, which is the most uh, solid of the sources, this is the range of massive population 3 stars, 
then you need these seeds to be around, and these are nonlinear objects which must be around, at these redshifts, depending on what mass you want to generate. So let's take the most conservative limit. You want 10 to the 8 solar mass objects at redshift of 6. You need nonlinear objects at redshift of 15 to 20. And if you really want to explain the reasonably observed object, you need redshift of uh, 40. You need these <coughs> nonlinear so why is this a problem? So in the Lambda CDM model, so you have perturbations with a roughly scaling variant spectrum, Gaussian perturbations. So if you have Gaussian perturbations, you can compute the number density of, of collapsed objects. And they are given, since it's a Gaussian distribution, uh, the larger the relative overdensity you want, the more exponentially suppressed the number is going to be. So this is the exponential suppression, which comes from the fact that you have a Gaussian distribution. This new is number of order one times <coughs> delta m over m, the, the root mean square mass uh, fluctuations which are present at a particular time. So this is the formula. So now you can use the power spectrum, the mass power spectrum, which comes from the lambda CDM model. So these constants, A and M sub C, they are normalized by the observed microwave background and isotopies. And so if you choose M sub C to be the mass within about 8 H inverse vector parsecs, A is 1. Let me stick this in. And if you compute the mass that gives you one collapsed object per galaxy volume, then you get the following seed mass as a function of redshift. So if you want one collapsed object as a seed per galaxy, because we see one supermassive black hole per galaxy, then the mass of the seeds that you get in an Anders CDM model scales with redshift in the following way. And okay, let's see, redshift 15, marginal, redshift of 40, no way. Okay, so in the Lambda CDM model, there is no way to get these massive seeds at these high redshifts. So this is. So that's a challenge. So now maybe one of you can come up with a modified gravity model which makes it possible to get these compact seeds. So there's a paper by Paul Steinhardt and David Spurgle. Sorry, one quick question. So how about the primordial power spectrum? If you change no. the we will not get anything. So you see the primordial power spectrum I normalized by the data. Yeah. Now you can't change that. I mean like a smaller scale, no, I mean the scale is not, yeah. 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 Yes, so. but you mean that that is a possible modification of the Lambda CDM model? Yeah. That goes against what inflation... No, no, I agree, I agree, but I'm just saying without really changing gravity or something. Just no, no, that's, I'm going to propose something where you also don't change gravity. Okay. But I'm just trying to make a connection. So maybe there is a modified gravity theory which will allow you to get these compact seeds without changing the power spectrum sure. on large scales. So uh, I think we are using a, a Taylor Gaussian distribution, and if you have a small non-Gaussian Taylor. OK. Now, the non-Gaussian is are constrained by observation. Right, but you're using the Taylor. I'm using the Taylor. Yeah, so. I don't know the answer to it. I've given this question to a student. <laughs> it's a very good, very good question. I suspect that the answer is going to be it is not possible if you just add a three-point function. So if you just add a three-point function, you're slightly, you're taking a Gaussian distribution and you're making a slight change. I think you'll be <coughs> in trouble with the constraints from large-scale structure and CMB before you can solve this. That's my guess. Now, my resolution is I will add something which has overall a very small contribution to the power spectrum, but it is completely non gaussian Namely, I'll be adding cosmic string loops. So cosmic string loops to the <coughs> And this is a paper that appeared yesterday morning. Okay. 
So um, now, from the point of view of particle physics, there's very good motivation to consider cosmic strings because a subset of particle physics models beyond the standard model predicts cosmic string solutions, past cosmic string solutions. And if you take such a theory, then inevitably you will form a network of cosmic strings in the early universe, and inevitably, by causality, this network of cosmic strings will survive to the present time. So this is this Kimmel mechanism. Now, the network of cosmic strings consists of long strings, a random walk network of infinite strings, and a distribution of loops which form from the intercommutation of these long strings. So, there is a scaling distribution of string loops, and scaling distribution means that the distribution of loops <coughs> is independent of length if you scale all lengths to time. So we know the only free parameter in this scaling solution is the tension of the strings, which is related to the scale of symmetry breaking in the particle. <coughs> so I'm going to make the hypothesis that. Since string loops are nonlinearities already early on, that the string loop will be the seed which mediates the formation of the supermassive black hole. So I'm going to replace population three stars by cosmic string loops. Okay? So what do I have to do? A string loop with radius r and mass field length mu will uh, attract accrete matter, will grow into an object with this mass because accretion starts at redshift of equal magnet radiation, and if you look at the mass at redshift of Z, then the linear perturbation theory growth is this. And these guys are central just And this is a distribution of cosmic string loops the, as a function of radius. And now I can do the same calculation I did with Gaussian perturbations. I can ask what is the radius of a string loop <coughs> which gives me the right number density to give one string loop per galaxy volume. So that's the calculation that I'm doing. And I will plot the result as a function of the tension of the string. Large string tension, small <coughs> string tension. The current bound, upper bound of the string tension is this one. And, uh, okay. So, and you see from this plot that even for string tensions which are much smaller than the current upper bound, you get enough high mass seeds at high redshift in order to see the supermassive black hole. Okay, excuse me. Uh, where is the bound coming for the string tension? Okay, the bound comes from the angular power spectrum of microwave anisotropies. Because strings are produced entropy fluctuations in the early universe, they don't give the usual acoustic oscillations. Because if we observe the acoustic oscillations, the total contribution of strings to the power spectrum has to be fairly small, less than 5%. This is where the bound comes from. OK, so now, if you just, we, uh, since only 5% of the total power comes from cosmic strings, there are Gaussian perturbations around. And so if you add the contribution of Gaussian perturbations in cosmic strings, and you ask what is the uh, mass of the seeds, then you find that at high redshifts, the seeds are due to cosmic strings. At low redshift, most of the seeds are due to conventional Gaussian perturbations. OK. So this is the message uh, from the appetizer to this talk, that cosmic strings can provide the missing seeds at high redshift to allow for the formation of the supermassive black holes. Can I suggest a simpler solution? Sure. Uh, <laughs> super effect and accretion. I mean, this formula that yeah, you showed for that's the right. it, it's just, it's a very simplified model. And yes. there are many ways to have matter falling faster into a black hole. I mean, for instance, let's say that we have dark matter falling into a black hole. You won't have any radiation pressure, mm -hmm. so then you could accrete as fast as you want. To me, that's a simple solution. Um, you don't even need you have, what, 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 yeah, Yes, that's possible. So what you're, take, you're, what you're doing is you're taking this one formula, and you're making this lambda much bigger than one. Yeah, I'm saying that that formula is not... Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
I mean, that specific. Right, but you have to show that that works. Yeah. And I think that this cosmic sin solution is simpler. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to do complicated possibilities. So I completely agree with you, except on the simplicity. <laughs> so that's my prejudice. I'm wondering about this big shift. We have a spring loop and matter is collected by gravitational attraction. Now, a spring loop with very low tension, uh, will that collapse inside its... No, it will not. No, it will not. It will not, will not fall without what it will, will not fall without what it says. So the spring loops themselves are not the black hole seeds. So because the spring loop replaces the conventional seeds like population three stars. That, that's the idea here. So what happens then? So the seed, you get this accretion, which is described by this yeah. one formula, and then that matter falls in. The and then the, the, the remnants of the string will later fall into the black hole. Or maybe the string itself. See, string loops eventually radiate yeah, the gravitational radiation. Yeah. So depending on what the radius is, the string will oh, that I could calculate. I could calculate whether the string loop still would exist. So what is the, at what ratio do these seeds then form and what is the mass of the seed? Okay, so you see I, I'm predicting a distribution of seeds, masses, as a function of redshift. So, so for the, so I will be predicting a range of black hole, supermassive black hole masses. <clears throat> but it, but the, but so I'm not giving you a very good answer. Yeah, because it, I mean we do know that I mean there's there's correlations between black holes and galaxies. So at some level you have to sort of those things have to fit together. Yes. At some level. So I'm just so I, I was I was assuming that, that you form seeds and then you kind of go into the standard picture, but that's not what you were suggesting. I guess. It's, you're no, constantly forming seeds. <clears throat> so basically. The, the strings are only a subdominant distribution. So if you take these string loops, they are distributed through the universe, but they are they are pulled towards the galaxies, which form from the loss of perturbations. So these string loops will be inside of the radius, which eventually becomes the, the galaxy halo. So, so I, I guess maybe maybe just as an illustrative example, I mean, how in the case of let's say this. Um, you know, t ten times, basically ten of the ten solar mass mm -hmm. uh, black hole. What do you imagine would be the initial condition that led to that? What was the initial seed that went into that? Okay. Okay. So. Um so it would be a 10 to the 3 solar mass object that has collapsed around a cosmic string loop by redshift of 4. And then later redshifts, you get, you get some more mass of it, right? Because you just get the green, or is it? So you're still forming more massive, supermassive black holes at later times as well? Yes. But, but what I'd like to do now is to move to the main course. Okay. Challenges of bouncing cosmologies. So why should we consider bouncing cosmologies? So one reason is because of the singularity problem <coughs> of standard and inflationary cosmology. So standard and inflationary cosmology are not complete because they both have an initial singularity. But I have another interest. Um, in looking at bouncing cosmologies because I'm interested in developing alternatives to inflationary cosmology. Not necessarily because I don't like inflation, but in order for a good theory to become even better, you sort of need competing theories. And so I also have a vested interest in developing competing theories to inflation, but these competing theories also have to give rise to different predictions which we can then tell observers to look for. So these are the two reasons to be interested in bouncing cosmologies. So a cosmological bounce could predate 
in stationary phase, or it could replace the in stationary phase, provided that you have a correct contracting phase. And I'll talk about what I mean by correct. And that's true. <coughs> so let me make another reason for studying alternatives to inflation is the fact that there are some problems with inflation. So first of all, if you have inflation with small field values, then the inflationary trajectory is not an attractor. There's an initial condition problem for small field inflation. This is a review on the week and week. Large field inflation, by large, small, I mean field values bigger or smaller than the path mass, this low mode trajectory is a local attractor. And so in that sense, there is no initial condition problem for large field inflation. It's a local attractor. It's good. However, there is an eta problem for large field inflation. So the typically quantum gravity corrections make the potential too steep so that you don't get inflation. So it's a problem in the context of supergravity, and it's a problem in the context of superstring theory, because in superstring theory, the typical fields have small ranges, except that if you, if you associate the inflaton field with some kind of string theory axiom. So now I just want to advertise a couple of papers which were written by a graduate student of Kumun Waffers at Harvard recently, which have not attracted any attention so far. So first of all, if you want to get axion, if you want to use a string theory axion to get inflation, then a single axion has a small field range. When you get a large field range, you typically need many axions, so that the effective axion field value is large. That is Anupam Mazunga's uh, assisted uh, axion inflation model, what's also called uh, inflation. And there's axion alignment or axion monodromy. But what has recently been shown by Thomas Rudelius in this preprint and a previous one is that two of these mechanisms don't work. So assisted axion inflation and axion alignment don't seem to work because of string theory corrections. So um, as an outsider, it seems to me that we do not have any <coughs> consistent realizations of inflation in string theory, in quantum gravity. So therefore, that should be a further motivation to look for alternatives. Okay. So what do the alternatives have to do? The alternatives have to be consistent with this beautiful data. So this is a map of the microwave background and so on. How about small, small field inflation? Initial condition problem. So, so if you quantify the data, you get this angular power spectrum of microwave anisotropy. So angular scale, large angles, small angles. This is a power. Okay, so you have to reproduce this data. Now, for people in Sweden and Norway, I want to put up a historical footnote. There were two beautiful papers, one of them by Peebles and you, and the other one by Zeldovich and Zunayev in 1969, 1970. This is 10 years before inflation. Where they studied exactly the conditions under which you would get this kind of curve. But this was 30 years before the curve. <laughs> so, this is a prediction that was made in these beautiful papers in 1970. And this is a graph that comes from the Zeldovich and the IFK. So this is time. This is co-moving scale, co-moving length scale. And this shows what fluctuations on these wavelengths do when they start to enter the horizon. So Sunyaev and Zeldovich pointed out that if you have standard wave fluctuations on scales which, from the point of view of standard cosmology, look super horizon, and these perturbations enter the horizon, they start to oscillate. And if you cut at the time when the microwave background is released, then different wavelengths will have undergone different numbers of oscillations. And it's a this beautiful black one. I can make a sketch. So uh, if you catch 
a wave. One of these wavelengths at the time when it's um, done a quarter of an oscillation, you will catch the wave at this same amplitude at all points in space. And therefore, you get no gravitational electron. Whereas if you take a wave which has done half a half integer number of oscillations, you will catch that wave at maximal redshift. So depending on wave, different wavelengths, will, you'll either catch them at a maximum or minimum of the gravitational redshift. And this will give rise, this is the origin of these acoustic oscillations in the under power spectrum. So to get that, what you need is standing wave perturbations entering the Hubble radius. That's the requirement. And this plot shows a further prediction that was made in these papers in 1969, 1970. The matter power spectrum as a wavelength. Oscillations in the matter power spectrum, and these are the baryon acoustic oscillations. So baryon acoustic oscillations, acoustic oscillations in the microwave background were predicted in 1970. And for that, what you need is you need um, essentially a roughly scale band power spectrum of adiabatic fluctuations on super horizon scales. And I put horizons, horizon in quotation marks because I'm in horizon from the point of view of standard advantage model. So these are the conditions under which you get these features which have now been seen. Now the question is how does one obtain such a primordial spectrum? And inflation is the first realization from causal physics how to get such a spectrum, but it is not the only one. So I'll now present um, another one. And to do that, I will give a brief review of the equations. So we are considering small amplitude linear fluctuations in both the matter and the metric. So this is the answers for the metric. Blue is background. Red is space dependent. These are the fluctuations. And for matter, I just take a scale of field for simplicity. So the equations for cosmological fluctuations come from putting this ansatz into the joint action for gravity and matter and expanding the action to a quadratic order. And you get this action. Since you only have one degree of freedom, since so matter fluctuations are related to metric fluctuations by the constraint equations, you know before doing any calculations that this is going to be the form of the action for cosmological perturbations. It's going to be a free scalar field action with a time dependent mass, background dependent mass. And the calculation which Sasaki and Mukadov did is to find the canonical variable in terms of the matter fluctuation and metric fluctuation. So, this is the action for cosmological perturbations, and this is the result in equation motion which tells, and since it's a linear system, you can look at Fourier mode by Fourier mode, and you find that small wavelength, large K modes oscillate, like they do in flat space time. Large wavelength, small K modes, they will be squeezed in an expanding universe, VK will grow proportionally to the If you start with vacuum fluctuations, then this is the initial condition. So this is a theory of cosmological perturbations three slides. This is the equation of motion, which, and let's do the same thing for gravitational waves. So we will add the gravitational wave sector. We will expand into polarization modes. And then we will again re to get the canonical variable. And the canonical variable satisfies this equation of motion. Let's compare this with the equation of motion for cosmological perturbations, for scalar perturbations. Looks very similar, except that this is Z, and this is A. Okay. So gravitational waves and adiabatic cosmological perturbations evolve in a very similar way. And if you take a phase in the universe where the equation of state is constant, Z is proportional to A. And in this case, gravitational waves and scalar metric fluctuations evolve the same way. 
So therefore you conclude that generically, if you start with vacuum initial conditions, the amplitude of gravitational waves will be the same as the amplitude of scalar metric fluctuation. So therefore, gravitational waves, which might have been discovered by the bicep satellite, by the bicep experiment, not satellite, in no way was a proof of inflation. In no way. Rather the opposite. So, in fact, even the amplitude of gravitational waves discovered, discovered or measured and now bounded by bicep is too large to be consistent with the model in which for the entire evolution of the universe the gravitational waves and the scalar metric fluctuations evolve the same way. So in order to be consistent with observations, there needs to be an extra mechanism which suppresses gravitational waves compared to scalar fluctuations or enhances scalar fluctuations relative to gravitational waves. Sorry, Robert, the <coughs> equation is the same, but the normalization is the same. The same. Vacuum initial relations. If you have vacuum initial conditions, the normalization is exactly the same. But they're the canonical modes. No, but they're not the physical modes. You, you convert to physical modes, it's exactly the same. The prefactors are still the same. The prefactors are exactly the same. I mean, I don't have time to go through every step, but... If you take a small field model, say Starominsky model, of course, the prediction for R is 10 to minus 3. Yeah. That's because scalar fluctuations get amplified during reheating. And in the same way, <coughs> no. yes. I mean, maybe they the, are. But, but if you do the computation forgetting completely about rating in a Starobinsky model, you get a ratio R, which is 10 to minus 3. Yes, I, I don't disagree with that. <coughs> the reason for that is that there's a change in the equation of state between inflation and after inflation. And that is the difference between Z and A. This is not equal to 1. Z double prime over Z <coughs> is equal to A double prime over A. But you have the ratio between Z and A at late times is 1. But during inflation, it is not 1. And that's the thing that gives you the... So that's the transition equation of state during reheating, which amplifies the scale of... Now, when I say amplify, I mean... This is with respect to a certain gauge. The invariant way of stating that is that, and that comes back to what you were saying, it's the canonical variables, and what, what you were asking, the canonical variables start with the same normalization. Sure, but the, the relation between the canonical variable and the physical variable, that depends on Z over A. And Z and A are not the same, because the equation of state to inflation is different than the equation of state term, but in after, after inflation. But R depends also on that ratio. So sure, because that's right. Or that, but, but again, so. I'm not convinced, uh, Robert. Uh, I mean, uh, if okay. you make the computation saying that Z is approximately equal to A. Let's talk about that, let's talk about that later. I'll just mention that there was a very famous paper by Dean Stein or Turner which is the first paper in, in the West, in, uh, sorry, first paper in North America to compute uh, metric fluctuate, uh, cosmological fluctuations in inflation. There's a preprint version of that with only two authors. That came to the conclusion that the amplitude of cosmological perturbations was 10 to the minus 20 in inflation because they did the computation incorrectly. They were not aware of it. So, I don't want you, to interrupt you, you too much. You are, <laughs> so, but what, <coughs> so with, the point that I'm making is that without a change in the equation of state, generically you'll get large R. And so discovering reasonably large R in no way can be interpreted as a confirmation of inflation. I mean, you're basically just telling me that in the inflationary models you actually don't predict a large R. And I'm saying co completely correct because there's this inflationary reheating mechanism which gives you this difference, difference in the normalization. So we actually don't disagree, but it's 
of any noise that if you do the computation set in z equal to a, you forget everything about rating, uh, you find that in slow roll models, uh, no. uh, <coughs> then you you don't. Over, it depends on the number of defaults. Uh, no. You have uh, no. 1 over n for um, the scalar, 1 over n. If you set z uh, equals a in an inflationary calculation, you'll get the wrong result. Yeah. You'll get 10 to the minus 20. But we, we talk Maybe about that later. And I can show you the, 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 the paper which did that. <coughs> Okay. Good. So, in inflation, we start with fluctuation. So this is a sp space-time diagram, space and time. The inflationary phase of exponential expansion, the post-inflationary phase of standard bank cosmology. Perturbations are generated as vacuum fluctuations on the sub scales, scales, the x and the traverse. And let's see how a scale invariant spectrum emerges. We start with a vacuum spectrum of the canonical variable. Power spectrum is k cubed fully mode square, proportional k square. But long wavelength modes are larger than the Hubble radius for longer time than short wavelength modes. They get amplified more. This is a calculation. And you find that because of this amplification of long wavelength modes outside the Hubble radius, the vacuum spectrum gets converted to scale. <coughs> so I'm not, I don't expect you to follow the algebra here, but, but the algebra is just on this side. So now I'm going to present you the bounce alternative, the matter bounce alternative. So this is space-time diagram, time and space. The matter bounce cosmology is a scenario where we just take the standard Big Bang model of expansion. We take the mirror inverse standard Big Bang model contraction with a matter-dominated early phase, radiation-dominated later phase, and we connect them by some new physics. And this is where modification of gravity can come in. <coughs> so now what happens is that long wavelength modes are larger than the Hubble radius for longer than short wavelength modes. And the curvature fluctuation grows in the contracting phase. Long wavelength perturbations therefore grow for longer amount of time than short wavelength perturbations. And in the same way as in inflation, the fact that long wavelength modes grow for longer time than short wavelength modes can convert a vacuum spectrum to a scale invariant one. And it is exactly in a matter-dominated phase of contraction that the relative growth of long wavelength over short wavelength modes is, has the right power to convert vacuum to skin down. And this is illustrated in, okay, here are some general comments about the matter bounds. So we postulate that fluctuations originate as quantum vacuum fluctuations as in the inflation. <coughs> The adiabatic fluctuations acquire scale invariant spectrum that I'll show you in the next slide. I just want to mention that the horizon problem and the flatness problem are absent in the matter bound scenario, and the size and entropy problems aren't either. This is the key challenge. And this is the computation which shows how a vacuum spectrum is converted into a scale invariant one, but I don't have time. Also, you can get a slight red tilt if you take into account the fact that there is a cosmological constant to get, as we've shown recently in this paper. Okay, so this is not the only bouncing cosmology. There's also the ekpyrotic bouncing cosmology. And in the ekpyrotic bouncing cosmology, you have an asymmetric bounce, you have a very slow contraction, and then usual expansion. And here you get a scale invariant spectrum if you work with an entropy model. But I want to talk about challenges to bouncing cosmologies. So now the first challenge is how do we achieve a bouncing cosmology? This new phase which has to uh, mediate between the contracting and the expanding phase. New physics is required. And here there has to be new matter which violates the weak energy condition if you work with general relativity, or it has to be corrections to the gravitational action in the ultraviolet 
which from the point of view of Einstein gravity looked like weak energy condition value. Now the challenge for you is to obtain a safe balance. And here a lot of the is same issues will, will arise as the issues we were talking about yesterday. You have to avoid all the possible instabilities. Because so now there are two ways that I want to mention that we can modify the matter sector to obtain a balance. One is a ghost condensate construction, or an in approved version of Galileo condensate construction. Or else we can use directly string theory matter. In this string theory matter setup, we get an S brain bounce. So there are various ways of modifying matter to get a bounce. But there are also various ways to modify gravity to get a bounce. So that is mentioned a couple of ideas. Again, to make connection with what we heard yesterday in Hojava Lifshitz gravity, if the spatial sections are not flat, then you get a bounce. <coughs> so there are various ways to get a bounce. But there's a big problem. And the big problem is the BK instability. So if you look at anisotropies, then the energy density in anisotropies will go as scale factor to minus 6, as opposed to matter and radiation, which grows as scale factor to minus 3 and scale factor to minus 4. So therefore, unless you tune the anisotropies initially at the beginning of the contracted phase to be extremely, extremely small, the anisotropies will dominate, and you won't get a smooth balance. <coughs> Now, the ekpyrotic scenario has a solution to that because ekpyrotic matter gives you energy density which scales as A of T to the minus P with P greater than 6. So if you have ekpyrotic matter, then that will overcome the anisotropies. Then you can save the bounce which looks roughly, um, roughly homogeneous. So that's a big advantage of the ekpyrotic scenario. So I look at you, Andrew. Although you don't work on the person. So I think people should not forget about this. You, you can get ekpyrotic models by, with the negative exponential tensions. Okay, now, if you want a man about scenario, where you, use, where you get the scale of that spectrum using the way that I illustrated earlier, then you can try to save this by introducing a phase of ekpyrotic contraction. So this is this ekpyrotic matter bounce scenario. This is not really nice because we are faced with a serious problem. And what do we do? We just throw in another ingredient. It doesn't look right. But it can be done. Good. Now something else. Another challenge for bouncing cosmologies. Four-dimensional bouncing cosmologies is you don't want the scenario to be cyclic. So if you want a bounce, a regular four-dimensional bounce, you do not want the bounce to be cyclic because if it is cyclic, you have a model which makes zero predictions because in each phase, the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations changes by two, an integer two. I already showed that you start with the vacuum spectrum and you get a skein variant one after the first bounce. After the second bounce, you get a spectrum which differs by two compared to a power law of a scale variance. So this is a pro problem which maybe some people are not aware of. <clears throat> so if you want to construct uh, four-dimensional bouncing cosmologies, you better make sure that they're not cyclic. Now, there are some cyclic models which do not suffer from this problem. For example, um, the Cyclic ekpyrotic scenario proposed by Turok and Steinhardt, that is not cyclic from the point of view of four dimensions, because in that scenario it's a separation between two brains which cycles back and forth, not the size of all dimensions. That does not suffer from this problem. And similarly, the cyclic inflation scenario of this was also the feeling does not suffer from this problem. Now, the last conceptual problem which I want to mention is a phenomenological problem. And this is a problem which has to do with uh, needing to suppress gravitational waves compared <coughs> to scalar metric fluctuations and doing this without producing non-gaussian entities. 
So here's an expression for the three-point function of curvature fluctuations, the general expression. And if you do the computation in the contracting phase of a bouncing cosmology, you find that the three-point function turns out to be order unity in dimensionless variables. That's before the bounce. That's about the limit that we have now. So it's nice in a contract universe, you get some nice predictions, which might be testable very soon. But there's a bounce. Before the bounce, the tensor to scalar ratio is more than one. So we need to have <coughs> non-trivial dynamics in the scalar sector to suppress the gravitational waves relative to the scalar perturbation, perturbations without messing up the tensor modes. And that's the phenomenological tension, which was also mentioned in a recent paper by Xiang Gao, uh, Lili, and Patrick Peter. So this is a whole list of conceptual problems. There are some ways out. But this is what I want you to leave you with. So bounds, and see, I'm not doing that poorly in time, because I didn't skip any slides to get from the last one to this one. <laughs> so first of all, the main message of this main course is that balancing cosmologies can provide an alternative to inflation in terms of generating a spectrum of, co of cosmological fluctuations consistent with observations and making predictions with which the model can be tested. The predictions would be three-point functions. However, there are severe conceptual challenges, in particular the anisotropy problem. And so I believe that we will need new ideas from quantum gravity at the bounce. And, they, and I also think that the re resulting cosmological models will look very different from the ones that we are studying now using effective field theory techniques. So that's making the connection with the title of the talk, maybe challenges for bouncing cosmologies. And okay, my favorite scenario is actually something I didn't talk about at all. And this is string gas cosmology, where we have this new phase, maybe at the bounce point, where we actually have a gas of strings at the Hagenau temperature, which has winding modes and all that, and where you get thermal fluctuation. Something that looks completely different from the usual bounce. So, thanks. <laughs>